times. We, we kind of got a little interactive and gave an opportunity uh, for you to share a little bit of what your perspective is when you think of a servant and when you think of a manager. Um, when we talked about managers, it did get a little vicious for a little while. Seems like everybody has had a bad experience with a manager or two um, at some point. But, um, but I hope that we got the point across that whether it's a good manager or a bad manager, that, that's based on what they do, but, but that the manager's task, the task before them, what they've set out to accomplish is to manage something, to... to um, Uh, organize something, to lead something in the way that the owner would want them to. That they're representing the owner of the organization or the business or the team to the team in the owner's stead. Paul gave us a warning uh, that, that one day our secrets and even our intentions will all be revealed. That includes all of the intentions of every single person. That's including the leaders in the church. That's including non-leaders in the church. That's including people outside of the church. So let's jump right into our text this morning as we have much to cover today. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Again, if you have your Bible with you, um, you can turn there, and it might not be exactly what's on the screen, because what's on the screen is the CSB. Again, it's not the right translation, and the others are wrong, but it's just, it's my preferred translation. So it'll be on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Paul writes, Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and to Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written. The purpose is that none of you will be arrogant, favoring one person over another. Well, this is interesting, isn't it? What things here is Paul applying to himself and to Apollos? What is Paul saying, I'm applying these things to myself and to Apollos? Well, everything we talked about last week. Everything he's been talking about in the letter, right? Remember what we talked about, something that's really important we understand when we read scriptures is that context is king. Context is king, right? You can't just take one verse and declare a truth from that one verse unless you've taken the time to study the context of what the author means in that Context. Nobody likes being taken out of context, right? No one likes being quoted, and, you're, and, and somebody approaches you, hey, did you say this? Well, I, I mean, I guess, yeah, that was sandwiched in the middle of a whole lot of other things. That's not what I was meaning by that. If somebody half heard or only heard a part of what I was saying, it's kind of not my fault. Well, God doesn't like being taken out of context either, okay? And so it's important that we look at the context. This, this was a letter written by Paul. Paul did not put the chapter and verse numbers there. He just wrote a letter, okay? And so everything we've been talking about for the last 12 weeks is point upon point that Paul has been building upon. And here he says everything, uh, no, I'm sorry. Here he says, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. Everything we talked about last week, their roles, their intentions, their need to move forward and to not second-guess themselves as leaders in the church, their responsibility before God. They're recognizing that God will judge their efforts and their intentions. Last week, the title of our message was found faithful because ultimately, at the end of all of our lives, what we're striving for, what we're living for, is that we be found faithful not by man, not by each other, not by people we respect and look up to, but by, by one, by, by Jesus Christ personally. I would, I would rather all seven billion people on the planet be disappointed with me if Jesus Christ finds me faithful. I'm okay with that. Now, I'll be honest with you. There are days I'm not okay with that. Right? No, no, nobody likes the drama. Nobody likes when people talk behind their back. Nobody likes to disappoint 
people. Right? I've, I've had so many conversations with so many friends who they struggle with the idea of disappointing people. And what's cool about God is oftentimes God will put them in a position where they are forced to choose if they're going to disappoint God or disappoint a person. God does that on purpose to work that, that muscle in us, that faith muscle, that striving to be found faithful muscle so that we slowly but surely lose the cares of what other people think of us and gain the care and the fortitude of only caring what Christ thinks about us. So Paul says, I've applied this to myself and to Apollos. So Paul and Apollos and and every church leader must live with this in mind. But Paul adds here, so that you learn from us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written. Now, this is an extremely important principle to understand. What does Paul mean when Paul says nothing beyond what is written? See, what Paul is referring to here is the levels of authority by which a Christ follower must live in submission to. Consider this. There are levels of authority in your life as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me be really clear here. There is not just one authority in your life. There are levels of authority that God has placed there. Some have taken this passage to mean that the Bible is the only authority, and therefore I don't need to listen to anyone but to God directly through the Bible. The irony of believing this is the Bible itself would disagree with that statement. For example, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, Peter writes, Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Now that passage of scripture sounds wonderful, and it sounds easy. Okay, Peter, thanks. Duly noted. The LIE says I should go 55. I want to be a good Christ follower, so I'm going to start going 55. Easy. Check it off. No problem. Let me rewind for a second and give you some context. Peter was writing to Christians who were being murdered and slaughtered by Emperor Nero and says, hey, Christians, being persecuted, being gutted, alive, being boiled, being dipped in oil and lit on fire while still alive and put on a pole in order to light up Nero's garden. Hey, little Christian children who you lost mommy and daddy because Nero came and killed them. You know what I'm telling you God wants you to do? He wants you to honor the king. Yeah, that's my thought. I agree. That's crazy. That's crazy. But that's how seriously God takes authority. And let's go just a little deeper as to why. Right? So Peter would admit and Paul would declare that there are other authorities besides the Bible. Paul states in Romans 13.1, In Romans 13, 1, he says, Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. Guess what? It means you need to stop hashtagging not my president. It means you need to stop hashtagging not my pastor. It means you need to stop hashtagging anarchy and down, down with the rulers and authorities. And, you know, God would want us to spark a rebellion. Listen, as Americans, we have rebellion in our blood. We celebrate it July 4th every year. As Christians, which is our higher authority than our government, we're told to submit to authority. Even corrupt authority. Even authority that abuses that power. We saw it with Saul. Saul was given authority by God as king. 
And when Saul did no longer honor God as the true authority, God removed Saul. David had many opportunities to remove Saul and wouldn't do it because David feared God more than Saul. It's not our place to choose who is and is not in authority. It's our place to submit as people who believe that every authority will answer to God, that every authority must be found faithful. So when Paul says, nothing beyond what is written, what does that mean? Here's what it means. It means the Bible alone is the highest authority. The Bible alone is the highest authority. You may have heard with the Reformation the five solas, right? And one of those solas is sola scriptura, scripture alone. And for the last 400 years, just like everything that happens, somebody is going to take it out of context, and there's a group of reformers who go, oh, that means scripture alone. Well, no, my friend. If you look at what the origination of what they were saying was, is they were saying scripture alone is the highest authority because they were battling with the Pope in that instance, and the Pope said scripture is an authority. I am the voice of God. I am a higher authority. And Luther would say, no, my friend, you are an authority. Well, actually, if you read Luther, he didn't say, no, my friend. Luther had a potty mouth, man. You should read Luther. It's really, don't let your kids read Luther. Uh, <laughs> but Luther would say, no, you blankety blank. You are not the highest authority. The scripture is the highest authority, and you are a authority who is under it. And it became the cry, sola scriptura. Scripture alone is the highest authority, but not the only one. So again, context, context, context. Uh, it means if your church leaders come up with a thus says the Lord statement, that it had better be confirmed and supported by the Bible, otherwise it's a lie. Think about it. If some new church leader showed up preaching this new information about God that intrigued everyone, but it wasn't in the Bible, then that would make this leader unique. It would make this leader a necessary go-between for us. Well, we no longer have direct access to God through his word. We now need Bishop so-and-so who has this divine revelation from God about this new thing that God is doing. Do you see the problem? This still exists in church world. It still exists. There are whole movements. One of the reasons that the cessationist movement, let me explain what that is. The cessationist movement is a group of Christians that believe that certain gifts that are in the scripture are not for today. That those gifts ceased upon the completion of the Bible and its accessibility. Now, let me tell you when that movement started. That movement didn't start in 33 AD. That movement started after a bunch of church leaders started going around using the gift of prophecy, saying, thus says the Lord, and changing things that were different from Scripture and making entire churches of people dependent on a leader instead of on God's word. And so like a pendulum, people reacted, oh, well, that gift doesn't even exist today. That can't exist. Look how it's abused. That can't exist. We still have that debate today. You go to some churches where nobody speaks English. Everybody, achko, blah, blah, blah. Now look, let me be really clear. Let me be really clear before anybody gets offended. I believe the gift of tongues is for today. I am charismatic. I believe the gifts are for today. Okay, nowhere in scripture does it hint that the gifts aren't for today. But the problem is when you walk into a room and everybody is trying to steal the attention by speaking in tongues, what they're doing is they're taking the attention off of Jesus and onto themselves. And like a pendulum, those of us who want to honor Jesus go, oh, that can't be the real thing, so therefore, tongues isn't for today. But really? So now you've drawn a conclusion from an experience just like they drew a conclusion from an experience rather than both of you coming together, sitting down over the word of God and saying, hey, our pastor is an authority. This church leader is an authority, but they've got it wrong because there's a higher authority that says they've got it wrong and it's the word of God. You with me? Okay, so we're gonna be a healthy, well-balanced, honest church. We're gonna be the church 
that gets in your face if you've got it wrong, not to hurt your feelings, but to save your very soul. Because there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. This isn't about hurting your feelings. This is about keeping you from running full speed off a cliff. Just so you know, sheep do that all the time. All the time. And you know the crazy thing? It's like, it's like driving in a storm where all you can see in front of you is somebody else's taillights. Sheep are like that. Dude goes over. He's not thinking, well, uh, that didn't work out. He's thinking, all right. Next one. All right. And that's, that's why we have, we have these movements. And then we go, oh, 10,000 Christians can't be wrong. Well, I got news, Toronto Blessing. You were wrong. <laughs> okay, you, you with me? Just because people follow you off a cliff doesn't mean magically there's no more cliff. We don't get to vote on that stuff. The Bible is the highest authority. Highest authority. Taken in its proper context. All right. I'll stop kicking the horse. It's not breathing. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. So, if this leader was given special revelation about God that wasn't in the Bible, we would be dependent on this person for us to understand it. That would make that leader superior, and we would all follow this leader over every other leader because they've been given a special revelation from God. Paul is letting us know the leader who says they have a special revelation from God is a liar. Just, okay. Paul makes it clear we are not to go beyond what is written. The Bible is our highest authority. As your pastors, Pastor Paul and I, we do have a level of spiritual authority. But it is far inferior to the scriptures. It is the scripture that we must submit to. That is why it is the scriptures that we teach. It is our goal. You spend enough time here. It's our goal that you will know the entire Bible from beginning to end, everything. It's our goal that you will see Jesus interwoven into the Old Testament. It's our goal that you will see Jesus in the future as when we cross over into eternity as the reigning Son of God who, who's not coming back as a sheepish, a sheepish lamb, who's not coming back humbly, like he came the first time, but he's coming back to kick some tail to make sure that anybody who snarled at him and called him their enemy knows what happens when you make an enemy of God himself. Paul says the purpose for not going beyond what is written is not only to protect you from error and false doctrine, but it's also so no one becomes arrogant and favors one person over another. The issue in Corinth was that many of the people within the church had actually fallen for the lie that they were superior. They actually believed that they were superior. They acted like it long enough. Nobody corrected them long enough that they legitimately thought that they were closer to God than the other people. Remember 13 weeks ago when we started this series? We talked about how Paul addressed the church when he, when he opened up in, in the first few verses of chapter one. Remember one of the things he did was he, he commended them for the gifts that they had. Remember the, the gifts that, that we said that they had, that, that they were wearing as spiritual badges, the gift of tongues and the strong emphasis on study? You remember when he, he commended them back, back in chapter one? And, and he was actually proud of them. He was proud of the fact that, that they had this gift, the gift of utterance, the gift of tongues, and that, and that they had this knowledge, that they knew the scriptures well, they studied well, they had a strong emphasis on, on knowing what the scriptures said. They were deep thinkers. And because of this emphasis, there were members of the church who thought they were better than others because they knew the scriptures better than others. And they could speak in tongues more than others. Well, this created an arrogance, and it added to the divisions in the church. So Paul addresses this here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. He says, For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive. 
if in fact you did receive it? Why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? God, we, we really are, are messed up, broken people. I mean, the, the fact that we still see these very same things to this day just tells you we haven't changed one bit. Human nature is exactly the same. The arrogant preacher who thinks they're better than others because of their ability. It's so ironic. It's so ironic. It's God who gives the gifts to the church. It's God who gives the very ability to preach to that preacher. It, it, it's, it's all of us though, isn't it? Think about it. We, we all suffer with this issue. We, we all tend to notice other Christians lack in an area where we're gifted. And then it leads to arrogance. Consider this. Consider this. You ready? Th there are those of you that have the gift of generosity. And when some other Christian either forgets to tithe or, or maybe gives only that base 10%, you're judging them. Because God has given you this gift of generosity for you. You just give and overflow and overflow, and it just, it's part of who you are. And you, you know, you're the guy who, who there's somebody on the side of the road holding up a sign, and you will stop at a green light to give them money, cause an accident, and then tell the guy behind you, listen, I'll pay out of pocket. I got you. Jesus loves you, right? You're that guy. And it's beautiful to be that guy. It's disgusting when you think every Christian should be that guy. God made you unique. He made you that way. Celebrate that. Don't judge other Christians who might not be that generous. Now, we should all be generous because Jesus is generous, right? But, but generous for some people is like, holy cow. Like, here, here you go. You ready? It's not a competition, but if it was, you all lost. And I'm going to give you one person by example. Her name is Mary. Not Jesus' mommy. I'm talking about Lazarus' sister. In one moment, in one moment, she empties out a perfume on him that is the value of one year's income. You all lose. Sorry. Unless someone's dropping 100 G's in the offering this morning, you'll lose. If you do, listen, thank you. God bless you. That, right? But what I'm saying is like, that's, that, that is generous. Now, if we all compare ourselves to Mary, we all lose. Ah, but there's somebody more generous than Mary. Mary lost another competition. And we don't even know this woman's name. All we know is she was a widow. And she had nothing but one tiny little penny. And all she had, she dropped in the offering. Oh, Mary just got blown out of the water. Mary should hate this widow, right? <laughs> you see my point? You see my point? Christians with the gift of mercy who can't believe other people struggle with forgiveness and letting things go. Christians with the gift of prophecy who can't believe others struggle to pull the truths from God's word. Oh, you read over and over and over again and you don't see what that clearly says? What are you, stupid? What are you, not spiritual enough? How about this? Instead of judging people, why don't you use that gift to teach people? Because that's why God gave it to you. That's why he gave it to you. The unique gifts and strengths that we have are actually given to us by God and we receive them freely. For us to brag about something we didn't earn is ridiculous. Which is why Paul asks the question, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? If Paul was Italian, he'd be like, Samad are you? Huh? You didn't earn this. God gave it to you because he loves you. And then you go and shove it in your brother's face? Paul continues his point in 1 Corinthians 4, 8. He says, you are already full. You are already rich. 
You have begun to reign as kings without us. <laughs> and then he gets a little emotional here in the midst of his sarcasm. You know, he's kind of like that parent who went a little too far for a second and reels it back in, right? Come on, parents in the room, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you know without the Holy Spirit, that little kid would have died many times. But then he reels you back in and reminds you, that's a little one, that's my little one who I have on loan to you. Check yourself, right? Paul kind of has that moment here. He's being sarcastic. You, you're already full. You, you, you're already rich? Oh, you've begun to reign as kings without us. Well, good for you. Oh, man, I, I wish you did reign so we could reign with you. Strong words from Paul. He's being sarcastic when he says to them, you're already full, you're already rich, you've begun to reign as kings without us. What he's saying is you're acting like you've arrived. You've settled in. You're, you're not living out the mission God set for us. You've made the world your home. Don't, don't you understand? You're, you're, you've, you've made this place where you're not focused on God's mission. Instead, you're focused on, on your own comfortable living. What do you find yourself living for? Seriously. Consider this. Let this weigh heavy on your heart. If you're feeling convicted, don't ignore it. Really, let this weigh heavy. Are you living in such a way that it would appear you have settled in in this world? Is your focus or your comfort reaching other people with the gospel? If we consider what Christ has done for us, how can we ever justify living to just pay bills and die? Listen, it's not about having a bigger home or nicer cars or longer vacations. It's about bringing Jesus more glory and sharing the gospel with the world around us. We should not be settled in and comfortable because we aren't home yet. How is it then that we should be living? If we're not home yet, how is it that we should be living? Look, if you're looking for applause, if you're looking for, for accolades, if you're looking for somebody to be proud of what you're doing here on earth, you're looking for the wrong thing. You know, I, I heard a story told years ago of these missionaries who were overseas for, I think it was like 20 years. And now they, they were coming home after their time of ministry. And they come back to the United States, and they happen to be on the same flight as a bunch of U.S. soldiers. And as, as they're waiting to get off the plane, there's, there's a gigantic crowd out there to meet them all. And the soldiers get off. And when the soldiers get off, they are met with applause and cheers and praise and little kids and their wives running up to them and give them a big hug and, and kiss with tears in their eyes and it's this powerful emotional moment. And here these two missionaries get off the plane after 20 years of being all in and giving Jesus everything they had in some other country. And there's silence. No welcome. No friends or family members greeting them with tears and flowers. No applause. The husband looks at his wife and says, I respect what they did, but look what they got. We're alone. His wife looks at him and says, Honey, this is just a stop. We're not home yet. Why would we get applause in a foreign land? They have no idea. They have no clue. Stop expecting applause and cooperation and accolades and cheers and a wreath around your neck before you cross the finish line. 
We're not home yet. We're not home yet. Live for that day. Paul continues in verses 9 through 13. He says, For I think God has displayed us, the apostles, in last place, like men condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are, we are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Up to the present hour, we are, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed. We are roughly treated, homeless. We labor, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we respond graciously. Even now, we are like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. Wow. Hashtag pity party, Paul? <laughs> what is this? The call to follow Christ is the call to die to yourself. The call to follow Christ is the call to, to die to yourself and to be willing to have all that you are and all that you have given as a sacrifice to Jesus in worship. With that being said, there are different callings for each of us uniquely. For the apostles during this time, it was heavy persecution. Did you know all of the original 12 disciples, minus Judas, would be martyred except John, who would be exiled to Patmos, a deserted island. Paul would lose everything. And just so you know, prior to meeting Jesus, Paul was quite wealthy and quite comfortable. Peter would be crucified, but would dare not bear any resemblance with his Lord as he says to the Roman guard, don't crucify me like my Lord. I'm not worthy to be crucified my, like, like my Lord. Turn me upside down. Even this day, we see our brothers and sisters in Christ in many nations all over the world being brutally beaten, murdered, persecuted harshly for the name of Jesus. Things that they're experiencing are things we don't even talk about in church. Like, it's, it's a bit taboo to talk about rape in church, isn't it? And yet, you, you look at the Coptic Christians in northern Egypt. We're talking about a government that walks in to their homes and says, oh, you're a follower of Jesus? Okay. Instead of just killing them on the spot, they force them to watch them rape their daughter and wife before killing them. All for the name of Jesus Christ. Then we take a snapshot of the United States church. And we see very, very little distinction between the Christian lifestyle and the typical American lifestyle. We are not only not persecuted, we aren't different. We are the church at Corinth. We must stop living for ourselves. We must repent and dedicate our lives to following Christ. This is not meant to inspire or encourage for a brief moment so we go, ooh, pastor made me feel better about myself today. If you feel better about yourself with the self-awareness that the life you are living is antithetical to the life Jesus Christ died on the cross for you to live, and you feel encouraged and comfortable with that, then I have not just failed, I have enabled you.
We're either going to be biblical or not. We are either going to make Jesus Christ Lord or we're going to pretend he's just our fire insurance. And I got bad news. If all you want from him is fire insurance, you don't even have that. A wise person I I met in a nursing home a few months ago. Don't even remember their name. For the job I work at, I I do uh, marketing with with a, a friend of mine. And we were interviewing these people for a testimonial video for the nursing home. And this one woman we met was very, very, very interesting. And she was full of these little sayings. And one of the things that that came out of her mouth, I don't even know what sparked it, but she said, hey, the truth has no friends. <laughs> I thought, ma'am, I'm stealing that. I'm like, you don't know this? I'm a preacher. <laughs> I'm stealing that. That's true, isn't it? The truth has no friends. But it sets you free. It sets you free. Paul says the apostles were men condemned to die. So as Christ followers, let us die daily to sin and to our own wills and submit to God. Paul says that the apostles were a spectacle to the world. So let us be spectacles to the world today. Let them be confused by why and how we live. Because that opens the doors to give us the opportunity to share the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Paul says the apostles were, were fools for Christ. Let us live like fools who would have no regard for the things of the world. Because what we hold in highest regard is the hope in the next life shared with Jesus. Like those missionaries, we are not home Yet, Paul says the apostles were weak. So let us be willing to live and work from weakness. When we are weak and in a trial, we struggle because we crave strength. We crave comfort. We crave some sense of of power and control. But it's the struggle. It's in the struggle. It's in the weakness. It's in the midst of devastation and pain and betrayal and hurt and the feeling like there's nothing you can do to get out of it and survive. It's those moments when your tank is empty empty that's when God uses you the most that is when he has your undivided attention that is when you see the power of God work through you in ways you still can't comprehend take a look at what he can do with empty broken end of their rope burnt out washed up desperate broken people Paul says the apostles were dishonored. It is amazing how bent out of shape we become when someone disrespects us. Isn't it? Listen, we're New Yorkers. We don't mess around. You cut me off in traffic? You? You cut me off? Oh no. That's it. Your child's blood is on your hands now. Hey, listen, The Godfather was not a movie. It was a documentary. This is, this is who we are, New York, all right? <laughs> you understand? This is a problem. When we don't receive the honor we think we deserve, we get bent out of shape. But the greatest honor is coming when we see Jesus face to face. Be willing to be dishonored here. Because in the process of losing honor, you may find that through that, many may come to know who Jesus is. I.e., Paul and Sosthenes. 
right? You remember that? The very, the very first message in, in this series. We, we barely cracked the page of 1 Corinthians. We were, we were in Acts chapter 18. Paul was in the process of planting the church in Corinth. And, and in the process, this guy Sosthenes, who was running the temple, goes to the local government to try to get Paul beat up. And they bring Paul in, and the judge is like, this is none of my business. You figure it out for yourselves. Get out of my courtroom. And after they throw them out, Sosthenes ends up getting beat up by the Jews instead of Paul. And then the beauty of it is when we, when we open up 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and Paul introduces himself, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, with our brother Sosthenes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Through Paul being dishonored and dragged through court and made a spectacle, through Sosthenes catching a little bit of a beating, Sosthenes was introduced to the lover of his soul and never turned back. It is not about you. It is about his glory and his honor. And if Jesus finds glory and honor through my receiving of dishonor, I'm on board for that. Paul says that the apostles were hungry, that they were thirsty, that they were poorly clothed, that they were roughly treated, that they were homeless, hard-working laborers, that they were reviled, that they were persecuted, that they were slandered, that they were the scum of the earth, that they were everyone's garbage. Who still thinks church leadership is attractive? Who hears this and says, sign me up? Oh, that, woo, that is glorious. I want that. I could just see the seminaries overflowing. No. No. It's the reason why every time I meet a young person that says, I believe God has called me to be a pastor, I say, you'd better be sure, because this is the one thing that if you're wrong about, you will suffer more hurt than you have ever experienced and than you can ever imagine. Only a fool would go into church leadership unless God said, this is what you're doing and I'm going with you. Only a fool. Paul is saying that Christianity is a call to live this out and to willingly sacrifice everything for the cause of Christ. But understand something. All of these things are things that the Christian should be okay with as they follow Christ. Everything we talked about here, this whole list, which is not exhaustive, there's more, right? But this whole list of sufferings and persecution and all those things, all of those things are things that as a Christian, you should be okay with happening to you as you follow Christ. But it may never actually cost you everything. It's possible. It's possible. See, following Christ means you're willing to lose it all but that doesn't mean you'll actually lose it all. God has different and unique callings. And a you know, perfect example, listen, there's, there are very wealthy people who are very far from God who will never listen to a poor pastor. And here, you know, we, we create these theologies like to be poor is good and to be rich means you may deal with the devil. Well, no. In fact, the early church was funded by rich Christians. The whole idea of house church it wasn't your, your, your poor person's house. The poor person's house in the day was like a 10 by 10 shell. Oh, so, so we conclude, oh, house church means it was only five people per church. Well, no. In fact, in one sermon, the church became 3,000 people. So where'd they all meet? There were wealthy Christians with gigantic homes who said, welcome everybody, my home is your home. Mikasa, Sukasa, we're one family. Let's all gather. That's what house church was. House church was epic. House church came with servants and butler service. Giddy up, right? <laughs> like that was, that was pretty cool. Church leadership 
though, is not just a willingness to endure those things, but a voluntary expectation. It's a voluntary expectation. Church leadership is about being willing to be least, being willing to be the servant of all rather than to be served. It's about laying aside every right that you've ever had and even ones you didn't know you had until you tried to cash them in. An example of that is, is, you know, many church leaders get burnt out because they don't have opportunities to rest. And sometimes when they'll take the time to rest and something pops up, they recognize the call means I answer the phone as long as I can. It's a recognition that it is not about you. I am not here to be served, but here to serve in the way that our Savior wasn't here to be served but was here to serve. We should all take Paul's example and apply it to our own lives. We must ensure that we never take anybody's word over the Bible, but we should submit to authority that submits itself to God's word. We must humbly recognize that the gifts that God has given us are for us to use humbly as we look to bless God's people and reach people who are far from God. And finally, we must live our lives for Christ with a willingness to sacrifice every convenience. We must live our lives for Christ with a willingness to sacrifice every convenience, with a willingness to sacrifice every comfort, with a willingness to sacrifice our own honor for the sake of the gospel. It's a challenge. I know that. I know, I know what I'm preaching isn't popular. I'm so glad that we don't take a vote on that. I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit gets to direct that. I'm so glad that he forces me to preach to me. I'm so glad that I'm right in the same boat with you. I'm not telling you to go across the sea and if you sink, you sink. I'm saying we're rowing together, and if you sink, I'm sunk. I'm glad that God has given us his word unapologetically, that he's no holds barred. And I'm glad that God is willing to hurt my feelings in love because my feelings lead me to a place of death and depression and damnation. And what he says and his truth does the very opposite for me. I'm glad that the good shepherd will break my legs and put me over his shoulders and walk me back in the direction I need to go because I'm a stubborn sheep just like you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Lord, we are in such desperate need of you. Lord, I ask that you would forgive us for the idols that we have constructed, God. Father, we worship the idol of comfort. We worship the idol of convenience. We worship ourselves, our own needs, our own honor, our own respect, our own dignity. God, we worship our own need to be right, our own need to be needed. And we place these things before our need and our hope and our desire and our drive to lead others to a saving knowledge of you, to share your gospel with others. God, we have a million excuses and not one of them are valid. Lord, forgive us as we repent, God. And we know, we know, Lord, we know what your word says. We know to repent doesn't mean to just say I'm sorry and keep doing it, but that the word repent means to actually turn 180 degrees in the complete opposite direction, God. We must turn. We must submit. We must die to ourselves and bow our knees to you and you alone, Father. Tear down the idols, God. 
God, give us the willingness to tear down our idols and to give you free reign over our lives. In fact, Father, forgive us that we have not yet done that. Father, teach us to stop worrying about the things that don't matter. Maybe we should read the Sermon on the Mount over and over again every single day to to remind us, God, that you tell us not to sweat the small stuff and outside of living specifically for you, it's all small stuff. So God, I trust you with my life. God, I trust you with my finances. I trust you with my relationships. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my children. I trust you, God, with with the opportunity to to be a leader in this church. God, I I trust you with, with your people here who have gathered to worship you this morning. God, I trust you with our future. I trust you with our present. God, I trust you to teach us from our past, God. And for the times that I don't trust you, and I know those times repeat themselves all too often, I ask you to forgive me and to remind me. And if that requires a loss of my dignity, if that requires brokenness, then so be it, Lord. God, I would rather accomplish nothing in the world's eyes and be found faithful by you than to feel like a success here and be shocked when you and I meet face to face and I realize I failed you. Break our hearts, Lord. Let us not be satisfied until you are our only source of satisfaction. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Last week, we left off that the leaders in the church 